I'm Monica Melpass on Inside Story, a key win for Philadelphia on the controversial Sanctuary Cities issue. But will it last? Let's get the Inside Story. Good morning and welcome to Inside Story. Let's meet our insiders this week, and they are A.J. Raju, attorney. Thank you for being here. We appreciate that. Dom Giordano, radio talk show host. Always Thanks, nice Monica. You, Dom. Jim Eisenhower, attorney. Good morning, welcome Monica. Welcome back, sir. Great Thank to you. See you. And Christine Flowers, journalist and attorney. Always good to see you as morning. well. So last week, a key ruling, a federal judge, Michael Belson, did rule for Philadelphia versus Uncle Sam, saying he had to weigh, of course, the enforcement of immigration policies versus safety of not just Philadelphia, but it would have reverberations throughout the country of big cities in our country, mm -hmm. uh, and decided that there was no imminent danger based on what the police commissioner told him, and said the sanctuary city's policy can stand. It, in fact, Fact because the federal government, he said, cannot withhold funding as a punishment or as an incentive if you want to take the positive angle. What do you make of what he said, Dom? Uh, I think it we're into the definition battle. I thought he said it's not a sanctuary city, or at least the mayor says it's, did, it's not a sanctuary city. It's complete violation of the law. It's a magnet to bring people here. There have been cases where we have seen people commit crimes that were here illegally that had come back. And Mayor Nutter, uh, I guess it was the last couple of weeks in office, rescinded his policy. Kenny then put it right back in, and even the Obama administration had come here and told him this is a troublesome policy vis-a-vis -vis terrorism. Monica, the um, Judge Bailson found that Philadelphia was in substantial compliance with the requirement that they cooperate with ICE. Uh, in cases where there are convicted felons, people who are dangerous, and those who there is a reason to believe, even if they've not been convicted yet, reason to believe that they would be a danger and convicted of these crimes. The city has been fully cooperative with the federal, the, the, with the feds. What the judge was saying was, we, in, in order to, um, you know, we, the, the, the federal government is supposedly, the administration is supposedly concerned with the safety of the citizens of Philadelphia, which is the case. Obviously they are. But what they're actually doing in trying to keep these funds from the city of Philadelphia is they're siphoning off funds that were like $1.5 million drop in the budget, were designated for first uh, responders for those who really are the ones who are supposed to ensure the public safety and again I want to say this statistically speaking immigrants illegal or legal have a very low rate of criminal activity in the city of Philadelphia and nationally. Yeah, uh, Monica full disclosure I worked for Judge Bailson when he was United States Attorney uh, it's a very intelligent guy wrote a very thoughtful opinion in this case um, and I think it's very interesting that uh, just about everyone in law enforcement in Philadelphia uh, supports Mayor Kenny's position. And Commissioner Ross has testified to say uh, we want to build bridges in the community and we're not out uh, as local law enforcement looking to just find people who are here illegally that have done nothing wrong other than that, waste our resources on that. We want those people to respect us, work with us, help us uh, prosecute real violent criminals. And let's remember, if there's a warrant for someone, the, the locals execute that warrant and cooperate. So uh, I think as a pure law enforcement matter, Judge Bailson was right on top of it and I think uh, most law enforcement people agree with that. But this was a key plank for President Trump, then candidate Trump. He said we're going to stop what in his you know words mm -hmm. uh, what caused a big controversy people who were alleged murderers and rapists from coming across a border and p causing problems in our big cities and send them back. Uh, so do you think he's going to continue his administration the Department of Justice is going to continue hitting on this? I think demagogues have three formulas that they three ingredients for their formula common enemy common religion common language and you you create the us versus them narrative in this case to win an election there was a common enemy which was anybody other than you know whether, whether it is uh, uh, women whether it is uh, immigrants wh whatever the common enemy was that the narrative for the base supporters you needed common language anybody that doesn't have their viewpoint and their rhetoric common religion Islam or anything mm -hmm. else that doesn't reflect their core values that's what motivated all of this this is the term sanctuary city it's not that the city of Philadelphia is looking to 
give safe harbor to criminals. And that's not what the nefarious thing that is happening here. Instead, the, it's the other intent, is to allow folks who are in communities enough voice and ability to come out and say that we have criminals amongst us and not right. suffer consequence as a result of them coming out. Is That's why the law enforcement right, but folks I would characterize are, uh, this uh, folks there is are in There is a favor. rule of law issue. We have people that are drawn here that are here illegally. Yeah, but so, and right. that is against the laws of the United States. It, Agreed. It that is, wasn't addressed here. Uh, no, uh, no, Don is right. But you know what? Go ahead. Uh, um, right. I agree. Mm -hmm. We can't be selective about which laws to... Right. Exactly. But in this case, the reason and the political uh, motivations behind elevating it to a discourse is not exactly that. But so also, can I say step, something, Christine, Monica? What's going to happen? Well, what, what's going to happen is this is probably going to be appealed by, um, the, by the government. It's going to go ahead. But this was really important because this was either the, it may have been the second time, I think, uh, that, that there has been uh, a statement made that the federal government simply cannot come out and make contingent on federal funding um, absolute compliance, absolute cooperation between local authorities and the feds. And let me just say one other thing. Um, yes, laws are being broken. You're absolutely right, but they're mm. civil laws. And we can't conflate criminal activity and, you know, and aggravated felons with the, the simple violation of civil good, laws in immigration. Point. And the other thing, Dom, to remember is you're right about the laws of the United States. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia police do not enforce the laws of the United States. So that's for federal authorities. Right. Uh, and and if you, once you start getting into should the Philadelphia police be enforcing the federal law, uh, right. I think you're going down a rabbit hole. But I don't think anybody's calling upon, at least I'm not calling upon them to willy-nilly being going and picking people up. But some people I, I think the problem is I worry, given the numbers of people that are arrested and all the things that go on, when we're making all these nuanced decisions about cooperation with the federal government, it tilts towards somebody that the feds ought to be able to keep there that potentially mm -hmm. is violent, has committed criminal activities. It's not the last we'll hear of it, for sure. All right, let's move on to talk about the School Reform Commission. Uh, it was dissolved this past week, uh, something that had been in the works for a while. Really, it started years ago when the mm -hmm. state decided because of financial issues with the city of uh, Philadelphia's or the school district's budget that it would impose its own group to oversee that. Now, the school district says it doesn't need that kind of oversight. It would rather have a low local school board of nine members and the mayor agreed. So the school board was resolved or the SRC. What do you think is um, going to be the long term implication of that for students and for teaching? And that's the real bottom line. I think the long term uh, is positive because it's going to return uh, to the citizens of Philadelphia and to the duly elected officials of our city, uh, the power to main the school board and and be responsible for what they do. Uh, the, the, the uh, sin in the creation, if you will, of the SRC was that it was sort of a faceless, nameless thing that was responsible to no one. Uh, and if the citizens had a problem or were concerned about a policy, who did you complain to? Now, Mayor Kenny, I give him a lot of credit, said, it's now my responsibility. You complain to me. I will take it. And I'm sure he'll be held accountable for that. <laughs> one of the complaints was that it was too uh, sort of uh, too tight within the power broker circles, right. you know, that it's who you know and that's right. how you get put on the board and maybe you're going to just mm -hmm. pass a policy because it's your friend that put you on the board. So that's why, in the first place, state control started and to get the finances untangled, certainly. Well, as a conservative, I like local control, but these were babysitters. The city of Philadelphia needed babysitters. That's exactly how I see it. That's how they got the funding. I don't know what's changed. What has changed here as far as reading skills, math skills, and also the deficit. A hundred million have. dollar deficit right. projected. So I'm glad to see this happen, but Jim Kenney will not be held responsible. He's a political genius here. Have all the power. They will blame the state or the suburbs for not giving enough money. It will always come back to money. How do you get around a $100 million projected deficit in 2019 <laughs> Well, I, I think and say that you're healthy now? Well, I, I will say this. To me, the debate is completely misguided. The debate should not be whether or not somebody else should not control the VCR mm -hmm. uh, and, and replacing SRC with the school board. The question is, should we still have a VCR in our house? I mean, we have a corporate model-based education system where it's, uh, it's standardized. That's not how we learn. That's not how technology works today. That's not how the society works today. And we are not 
ch having a debate about whether it should be competency-based education system, empowering teachers, sure. recruiting the best kind of teachers, paying them more, and then expecting more from them accountability. All of that is lost. All you're doing is going from one authority having their cronies to new authority mm -hmm. having their cronies run, but it's the same VCR. Right, and, 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 and AJ makes a really great point here. I mean, the, the, the optics are great. There's this revolution, and everybody was talking mm -hmm. about the historic dissolution. They have right. self, you know, imploded. Um, but really, unless there's substantive change, and unless we know who these local people are going to be on that school board, it's the same problem. We're just just changing the characters, just shifting the chairs on the sinking Titanic over here. And I like what Dom said, too. Really, what fiscal distress have we overcome here? I mean, our, our former um, you know, panel member, the beloved Farah Jimenez, that was one of the reasons for her vote. I mean, what what has really changed? There hasn't been any kind of real improvement. And you got to keep in mind, we have uh, Dr. William Heights, superintendent of the schools, until 2022. So some uh, progress mm -hmm. needs to be made in order to not just re continue keeping him or recruit other great people to help head the school. You can't just pass it around and hope that things resolve themselves. I like Hyde a lot, but to Christine's point, I don't see any mandate here toward this. I just see a mandate to now we're feeling good about ourselves. This is part of the revolution, Helen GM, the councilwoman and the like. Mm -hmm. And it's like knocking a, a statue down. We've knocked this down. But what is it that is going to be the core that's different here, that's revolutionary, that's going to change things? Monica, can I stand up for having influential people uh, on uh, <laughs> the, the school board? Uh, the founder of our firm, Richardson Dilworth, former mayor, mm -hmm. Uh, was the chair of the school board right. uh, in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and by all accounts did a phenomenal job. It's not a bad thing to have someone who's a proven leader who has a vision uh, and, uh, and knows how to get things done. All right, Republican Speaker of the Pennsylvania House, Mike Terzai, threw his name in the ring for gubernatorial mm -hmm. uh, consideration, one of four Democrats to do so. And uh, we're going to see how it all works out. Do you think that this is going to be quite an exciting race? Uh, I'm sorry, Republican nomination. Uh, what do you think is going to be uh, the bottom line as they all challenge the incumbent Governor Wolf? Well, I think in the primary, this guy Wagner is a Trumpian sort of figure, but now he's moved away from Donald Trump after the most recent results. So him being in the race alone, Monica, throws a lot of stuff and taking the other guy was an opponent in another race, making him the lieutenant governor. Right. The thing I'm most excited about is the Fetterman guy, the six foot eight imposing figure in Denham <laughs> running for lieutenant governor. He uh, gets the Democrat Party particularly, I think, afraid of what might happen if he is the lieutenant governor. The mayor I hope he is. I want to see that. Yeah, right. exactly. It's going to exactly. shake things up, no doubt yeah. about I it. I think uh, uh, Mike Terzai's entrance into the race is very significant. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a real figure. Uh, he also uh, has a political base in Allegheny County in western Pennsylvania. And if you look at the history of Pennsylvania politics, particularly in governor's races, that east-west matchup, and while, and while Governor Wolf isn't from Philadelphia, mm -hmm. he sort of feels more like a, a, a Philadelphia candidate. He's had tremendous support in Philadelphia. Uh, I think it, it, if it ends up Terzai versus Wolf, that's going to be a very, very interesting and hard-fought election. But he doesn't have the name recognition in the South. And he is going to have the battle with some of the folks who uh, didn't support in the last race. That has been a challenge he, he for Republicans. He has name recognition within the Republican Party and the power base, and they they can get the votes and the interest out. And that's why this is much more of a, a significant mm -hmm. announcement with Tarzai in, because it gives a, a, a real opponent to uh, Governor Wolf, who, quite frankly, is a, a weak candidate. But I think right now it is his election to lose. All right, let's talk about Senator Bob Menendez in New Jersey. The corruption trial was declared a mistrial last mm -hmm. week, at least a temporary victory for him until we wait and see if they're going to retry the case. Uh, it is a higher bar that's been set because of a recent ruling by the Supreme Court uh, about corruption cases. Does it all but render prosecutors unable to find or proceed with a uh, corruption case? Well, there's no question that uh, the Supreme Court's decision uh, in the McDonald case really has uh, put a significant obstacle in the way of federal prosecutions of, of federally elected officials, and, and it did uh, play a big role in the Menendez case. Uh, you know, I, I've always felt that when the government takes that long to put a case in, uh, you, you think it's going to be a problem. Jurors don't like that. They get bored. They get resentful. Uh, 
And uh, from what I understand from some of the jurors' responses, they kind of felt, geez, if I had a rich friend, I'd hope he'd give me gifts too. And that was part of the, the uh, poll in this right. case was they had a long-term friendship. He and the uh, mm -hmm. doctor from Florida that flew him places, provided hotels, that kind of thing. And may, there may not have been enough quid pro quo, at least for this jury. We'll see the next time. I, I think that's, that's the standard. There has to be some evidence of quid pro quo, and it has to be pretty obvious. I don't know if the... Uh, the prosecutor, uh, prosecutors uh, laid out that in very clean and, and simple form. I thought, I thought the they did. McDonald I think case. it's a Jersey jury, and you have one jury asking, yeah. what's a senator? Yeah. As yeah, soon as exactly. I heard that, I said, oh, man, this is going to be uphill here. And they're, they're bonding. The one juror who got kicked out was bonding with Menendez along these lines. What's wrong with this? I'll do it with friends and all that. Legally, uh, I don't think that stands up, but the jury... But that's our Bought system. It. Exactly. Yeah, All right, that's we're our gonna... system with joint nullification. Yeah, exactly. That's we're going to take a break. Inside Story continues right after this. Stick around. 6ABC's Inside Story is presented by Temple University.